start, um, I just spend some time in prayer. I just feel like it's a good time to be in prayer right now. And when I say amen, and when you say amen, let's get up and greet you. It's okay. So Heavenly Father, how precious is your love, how wonderful your grace, and how marvelous it is that you have given us this gift of your Son, Jesus, that we might, um, through him, come to be known as your children and to share into this, this great fellowship, this communion we have with, with you, that you might dwell with us, that we might be able to come to you and worship you, knowing that we don't come blemished, even though we are not perfect. We don't come blamed or guilty, even though we deserve it, but we come re as redeemed as those who are righteous because of your son's sacrifice on the cross for us. And so, Lord, we gladly come before you today to worship, Lord. We ask that um, you would cause in our hearts a spirit that is uh, yearning for you so that our thoughts and our words to you this day as a family together might be pleasing to you and your Holy Spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're in the book of James. Um, and we're only going to look at a few verses. That's all I could take this week. Just a few verses. Very exciting passage, very deep passage. It may not sound like it at first um, as we read it, um, but it is continuing an argument uh, that James is giving regarding how people in the church should live in light of their claims of following God, of being people of faith. As you can tell, uh, I borrowed this morning's sermon title from a well-known country singer. Um, it seemed appropriate at the time. Um, and I think you'll agree. We're going to be in the fourth chapter of the book of James. Um, just to, to catch you up, you know how they say, you know, on serial shows, they say, last week... So last time we looked at uh, a passage that ended that wisdom from above, okay, the idea of wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So really nice picture, right? You know, we have you know, sincerity, we have peace, we have righteousness, we have, you know, full of mercy, we have wonderful things happening at the end. And then he begins the next portion in chapter 4 with this morning's uh, first six verses. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Immediately. Um, is this, is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is of no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So we're going to stop at that point right there and try to figure out you know, what James is getting at. Um, this is a, it's admittedly a passage that you would say is not the most bright and optimistic, cheery. James is not right and say, hey, good job, you guys. You guys are right on target. I'm so proud of you. In fact, it's quite the opposite. 
Now, a lot of times we read passages like this, and our first instinct is, that is not me. <laughs> that he's talking to someone who's much worse than me, and, and I can tell you, I put together a list of the people he's talking about that I know. <laughs> you know, raise your hands. No. Um, so that we have a real good idea of that something is serious here, but a lot of times we don't equate that to ourselves. Well, you can rest assured that the people receiving this letter in James' time didn't think it was them either. You know, you know he didn't come out and say, oh, you know, you, you fight, you, you want to have something, you don't have it, so you murder. They're not like, yeah, you got me there, James. Boy, you know, my bad. You know, this is not, you know, and everything in here is, is not like, um, you know, just a library. Hey, you guys need to tone it down a little bit, you know, kind of think about each other. You know, you kind of get mad and kind of say a few things, maybe you regret. No, everything is, is to the nth degree. So I want you to, to hear this, and this is why it's very difficult to interpret. You know, it's always, um, when you read through this, is what is James really saying? Because he just finished saying, you know, harvest of righteousness by those who make peace. Well, remember, this is, uh, again, a, a section that, that James uh, began by saying, who is wise and understand among you? Okay. That's still the question that's going on in the conversation. Who is wise and understand among you? Uh, the fact that he has kind of turned this upside down, it's starting to lead us to understand that he thinks none of you are wise and understanding, and I'm going to show you why. He begins by saying, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Uh, he's not asking to expect an answer because he's going to give them the answer. So it's a rhetorical question. Is it not this that your passions or your desires are in war, at war within you? And, and I love this idea of your passions are at war within you. The, you know, the first thing I thought of, and I don't know if any of you I know that a few of you can relate to this, but some of you, many of you can't, but um, the first picture I had when I read this is Darth Vader. <laughs> it's the Star Wars character who was always the one who was a really good guy in the beginning and then became a really bad guy. And, and then his son shows up and says, no, you're good, I'm going to save you. And, and he says, I can feel the conflict in you. And he says, there is no conflict. You know, but you know there is, right? And in the end, he turns out to be, yes, I'm a good guy. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a conflict, and we kind of understand this, right? We understand the idea of wanting to be good, and often finding ourselves filled with ah, wrath, and filled with, with desires of, of wanting to have things, and not really caring who it inconveniences that we to get it. The desires are at war within you. And this idea of war is, is very important, not just for that thing. So we'll touch on that in just a second. Your, your passions are war within you. You desire and you do not have. So you murder. And you can, you can <laughs> what's the first reaction? It's like, whoa, 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 murder, you know. Let's wait a minute, you know. That's, I don't think that I could do that. Um, very strong. I mean, that's, that's kind of the end thing. You don't have, so you work. It's not like you don't have and so you take, which is not good either. You don't have, so you steal. That would be kind of, we could stomach that a little bit. You don't have, so you murder. Okay, so keep that in the back of your mind. And then he says, you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. So that, that doesn't sound as bad, right? But he wants you to understand that's just as bad. In fact, he, those are equal statements. So we'll examine that in just a second. You know, it's, you know, we understand the fight and quarrel, right? Remember, this is in, at least in partial context, context of the church. It's not like he's saying, you know, you look and, and at your house, you see your, your neighbor has a really nice peach tree, so you stole it, and, yeah, you killed him and took the peach tree. That's not what he's saying. That's kind of the 
St. Augustine thing. You know, the idea of wanting something so you do some kind of crime to get it. But he's talking about it in the context of the church. He's talking about it, how Christians act to one another. Now, far be it for me to say or imply that within the context of a church, uh, people have acted from time to time to try to get their own way. Because we know that never happens in the context of church, right? Certainly it was a problem in James' time, and after careful thought and growth and, and evolving into people in 2,000 years who understand the precepts of God, we're still in the very same place that we were 2,000 years ago, and that oftentimes um, we find ourselves in conflicts and fights and quarrels in church over things we want to see in church. Now here in James' instance, it's going a little deeper. It's going with, with those who are um, really taking action um, against other people in the church because they want to obtain power or they want to obtain position or influence in the church. We talked that in previous sermons in James. So if you want to review that, um, go online. And uh, our YouTube channel or our webpage and, and listen to those. But... You know, any time that someone comes into church and wants to exert authority and have their way done, happens all the time in churches, and it is devastating. Okay, so uh, you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And this is where we start getting into the question, what is he talking about? Is he saying you don't have because you don't ask people? Or you don't have because you don't ask God. And it's hard to understand because the very next sentence is saying, you do ask. Okay, James, what are you saying? We don't ask, but we do ask. So um, this is how I see this little quandary here. You do not have because you do not ask. You do not have because you do not Ask for the things you should be asking for. You do, in fact, ask, but you don't receive because you ask for things that will satisfy your passions, your longings, your your desires, rather than to uh, receive that the good that God has for you, and ultimately to receive Him, to to Lord. Give us what you are providing for us rather than, Lord, I want to see, you know, more cowbell in our service. You know, make it happen. I love the cowbell. Bring it in. You know, just something that you pick that you say, I want it this way. I want to get my way. Lord, make me get my way. You understand what I'm saying? Because it'll make me feel good. that will be like this. Or sometimes it's like, Lord, you know, in, in the very corrupt sense. You know, Lord, you know, make us a great church so that I can quadruple my salary and and buy a four-bedroom house in Santa Cruz and, and do all those things. That would be me asking for something that is wrong. That is me basing my faith on how God can supply my desires that are no different from anyone else in the world. You just understand? And we hear a lot of that coming from just pulpits on TV. That is exactly what James is talking about. You don't receive because uh, you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. And then he makes this statement. In the ESV, I read, uh, you adulterous people. It is actually, you know, the from the Greek language, you adulteresses is the phrase. You adulteresses. Now, in later manuscripts, uh, on which, for example, the King James Version and New King James Version, the, the Greek writers kind of slipped in adulterers and adulteresses to get across the idea he's not just talking about women. 
and so ESV solves that by making it a very gender neutral, neutral to people, which I totally do not agree with because that negates some of the point of what James is saying. It has to be adulterous, not only because it shows up in the language that way, but because James is saying something to them uh, that is intended for them to be shocked when they hear it. Okay? It's like when you write an email, all capital letters or text, you know, ah, you know, it's like, and you can hear it, you know, when you get a text or read an email and somebody's writing to you, then all bold letters, it, you can actually hear the, the words, you know, ah, you know, right at you. It, it's meant for them to be accused of something they will ultimately deny, right? Adulterers, adulteresses, and, and they know it includes the men too. So, you know, it's like for a man to be called an adulteress, it's like, whoa, you know, that's insult to injury in a sense, you know. You're accusing my faithfulness and my manhood. But, but actually, what it is talking about uh, has, it involves two things. First of all, it, it does go back to the fact that in James' time and in ours too, if we have to be honest about it, that a man, when he is unfaithful, he's a cheater. When a woman is unfaithful, she's not the tall dress. You know, she's, you know, there's a lot of worse words I'm not going to use. But we use a stronger sense of it because it seems even, you know, remember in Jesus' day, um, in that passage in John, which are in many manuscripts, later manuscripts, that that Jesus, when he sees this woman who's kind of dragged out into the square, she's ready to be stoned because she's it was, it was caught with another man in you know, adultery, and they're ready to stone her, but curiously, the man is nowhere to be found. So. There's this stigma, first of all, of this. It's especially bad if a woman is unfaithful. Okay. Right or wrong, that's okay. Second of all, that this is talking, making a reference, not just to the people as individuals, but to the gathered people. That they are adulteresses in the same way that the Old Testament refers to Israel as being an adulteress to God because they are in this relationship that has the, the, uh, what's, what's the word? I had a word for this. Heart, proud heart. Yeah, no, no, that's not the word. Uh, that has the intimacy, I guess that's the word I could use, with God that can really only be compared in the same ways as marriage is, the people of God, to the Father. A very intimate relationship, it's very special. Uh, that, that not only uh, connotes love, but faithfulness, uh, uh, eternal uh, betrothness. And that uh, Israel, for example, and, you know, in the book of Hosea, that's, this is a book that's very famous for its statements about Israel being an adulteress. When God says, Hosea, I want you to take this woman as a wife who is a lady of the night. She is a known adulteress. <laughs> And she, I want you to take her as wife, and she's going to be continually unfaithful to you. So that she will stand as a symbol for how Israel is continually unfaithful to me. You haven't read Hosea? Good reading. I recommend it. So those are in chapters 1 to 4 in Hosea, right? So, uh, so this is what's going on. And so before we go on with this, I want to backtrack a little bit and, and connect that idea of adulteress and get a sense for what James is doing. James is talking to people who are generally of Jewish background. So when you are a person of Jewish background, uh, you tend to, more than under other people, understand your history, right? I mean, there's probably not a lot of people uh, that the Chapmans talk to in the Congo that understand American history like most people. Well, actually, let's be honest, most of us don't understand American, but, but a lot of Americans understand history better than people from other countries. I don't understand history of people in Croatia. I'm part Croatian, but I've never lived there. 
So Jewish people would be understandably understand, especially the history that's recorded in Hebrew scripture, right? I want you to see what James is doing to these people. It's brilliant. It is brilliant. Look, if you go back to verse 2, he's saying, what is it that is causing your quarrels? Your, your fight? Is it not that your passions, your desires are at war within you? And he gives this example. You desire and do not have, so you what? You murder. There is a very, very famous instance in Jewish history that involves a certain person who desired so much that he murdered to have that possession. Are you tracking with me? Does that remind you of a certain king, David, who sees Bathsheba, somebody else's wife, bathing on a rooftop. And he says, Hey now, <laughs> I feel some desires in my heart. And he, he longs to, to have her, but you know, that would be adultery. That would be a bad thing. You can't do that, King David, because that is adultery. So he devises a plan so that he can have this woman and not be an adulterer. And the way you do that is it's not adultery if her husband's dead. So her husband's part of the army, right? And he says, oh, I want you to wage war against this rebellious city. We need to, we need to soothe, you know, get the situation under hand. So send Uriah the Hittite, Bathsheba's husband. Send him there and take his troops. Uriah who's very Faithful to David, he says, put him in the front lines. And they go to battle, and you know, Uriah doesn't die right away. He says, you need to stick Uriah right in the front, like in the castle gate, right below where the arrows come down. So that's where he needs to be. That's, I, I've got a feeling it's a good plan. Put him there, and of course, Uriah dies. Right? And he takes Bathsheba as his wife. And she produces the son of Solomon. So, anyway, so this idea of you um, desire and do not have, so you murder, is the first thing that might come to these people's mind. Oh, I see. Because that, no one agrees that that was a really strong move by David, right? That's the poor judgment there. And what's curious about that is that he didn't want to commit adultery. So he murdered after coveting his neighbor's wife. So in order to avoid one of the big Ten Commandments, right, thou shalt not adultery, he commits two others. Okay. So by James saying that, he kind of raises his bar and said, you, you think that what David did is bad? You're doing the same thing. I say, I don't see how that's possible. We're not actually killing each other. You know, I don't have a, you know, Jerry must go. I have to think of the plan. You know, we're not doing that. Right? I, I hope we're not doing that. Um, uh, we don't plot in that way. And yet he says, you know what? You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. And he places that on the very same level as... David killing Uriah the Hittite in order to take his wife Bathsheba for himself. So that's a shocker. Now someone else might say, well, okay, I, yeah, that's bad, you know, admittedly. But at least he didn't commit adultery. So then James says in verse 4, you adulteresses! You have, because um, this special relationship that God has had with His people, you've totally turned aside because of your own passions. That's what he says in the next phrase. Do you not know? Now this, this connects with his, um, with his question in, in chapter 3. Who is wise and understanding among you? 
Okay, if you're so wise and understanding, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? That is, if you are friends, and the word used here is philia, that we use for brotherly love uh, a lot of times, but it also is used um, in a connective sense. And that's the essence of the word, is the connection. Is the brotherly connection, is when Jesus asks um, Peter, do you love me? Are you connected with me? Are we on the same page? Uh, do you, are you by my side? Do you got me like I got you? That's the idea of it. Do you know that when we do that with the world, and, and we do things according to our desires that are in the world, we are, uh, we are, the word here, is, this is really hard. It's explained in the next verse, so I'll just move on. <laughs> the, the friendship of the world is enmity with God. That is, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And this phrase uh, is, uh, if you look back, if you have your Bibles, look back in chapter three. Uh, a couple of Sundays ago, we looked at this phrase, remember this verse, how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Right? And then the next phrase, the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members. Okay, that's the exact same word that's used to make himself an enemy of God. It means to place oneself, or to be placed, to be associated, to, to infiltrate, and in the sense of the tongue, to, you know, become a part of that body. And in this sense, so it reads like this, whoever uh, has wit, it's actually, uh, whoever has placed himself or said, wanted by their desires, I'm a, I'm a friend of the world. This is where my allegiance is. Um, and, and you know, it's very hard for us to imagine Christians saying that, because we, we know that's the wrong answer, right? But whoever lives their life in a sense that their passions are driven by this world, what we can get from this world, what the values of this world or society has decided they should be, then that person has placed himself as an enemy of God. They have basically set up camp in the camps of the enemy of God. That's what that means at its core. Even though they're sitting in church. They are spies, they are infiltrators, they are people who have set themselves in enemy. And he says, or don't you suppose it's, do you suppose it's of no purpose that scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? Which is a very strange statement for two reasons. One, no one knows where, <laughs> where it says that in scripture. You know, perhaps James is, is referring to a, a biblical writing that's not involved in the canon that maybe is a more recent thing. We don't know. It doesn't appear in those words anywhere in Scripture. But the fact that James is using it conveys the true idea. Don't you know that he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made uh, to dwell in us? You know, we could read this, uh, the same idea in, in the book of Jeremiah, uh, chapter 31, verse 20. Is Ephraim or Israel my dear son? Is he my darling child? For as often as I speak against him, I do remember him still. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I will surely have mercy on him. This would be something that Israel would know because their very hope is on the fact that God yearns for them still. He still he still wants them around, even though their history has been so you know, blemished, to say the least, as far as being faithful to God, that He yearns for them. And so now you see what the real issue is. Is the fact that, you know, He uses, changes the words, and passions, and desires, and 
coveting and obtaining and friendship and hostility and yearning, that all of these are describing how God views his people. And specifically in this sense, the church, the body of Christ, who have been redeemed to God through Jesus' sacrifice. And this is where the beauty of the gospel comes in. Because oftentimes uh, we isolate the gospel to a certain thing, right? It, you know, it's a religion, it's a, uh, uh, there's a certain morality to it, there is a certain legality to it that Jesus paid the price of the cross for our sins. Um, so you need to recognize that legality and accept that grace and then you'll be saved. And yet, at the very core foundation of Christianity, it is simply this. That God loves us so much that His heart yearns for us to know Him. Not to be consumed by, by whatever we can gain as far as getting our way, or getting our dreams fulfilled, or, or, you know, whatever it is that we desire that, that the world also desires. Because the world doesn't desire Him. So what God did, because we couldn't have Him, is He sent His Son, Jesus, so that we could have Him. And through Him, have the Father. So it's this yearning of God. I want them to once again be in a position where we have a relationship and intimacy that's likened to a marriage. The way that a marriage is supposed to be. Right? A closeness that and a togetherness that is unmatched. a purposeful commitment to forever and ever, except in the Lord's case, it is not till death into his part. Because Jesus took care of that on the cross, didn't he? And so that's why James says, he gives more grace. That in light of the fact that the people who have come to faith and then kind of gotten into the church context and they act just like the world or the way they did be, you know, before they came to the church and just, just wanting their own way, their own desires that, that God has said He has given more grace and that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. That is a quote from Proverbs chapter 3, 34, that, that he gives this grace to people um, who are humble. Uh, Douglas Moo, who's a commentator, uh, current, um, prof I think he's still a professor, he's been at Wheaton for a long time, doctor, just, I really like his work. Um, and he wrote on this passage, he says, If God gives the grace to meet his claim on our lives to those who are humble, then we must become humble if we expect to enjoy that grace. But there's a reciprocity to what's happening. That God gives grace to those who are proud in order to cause their hearts to be humble. And to the humble, he gives grace. And the next section, which we'll talk about um, next time, is talking about what, the, what that looks like in terms of what we need to do. But what I want us to take away today is um, the idea that we go from, in this passage, we've seen the last few weeks of the, of the tongue lighting a fire and set among our members, and it obeys our desires, right? Our passions, our unbridled, uh, undisciplined, humanness. 
And yet we claim to be wise and religious and Christian, and yet we are found quarreling with one another um, simply because we have passions and desires in our hearts to get our way, and we think we're right because we are proud. And when we do that, we are denying any kind of relationship with God, really. We are being adulteresses. We are not being the bride of Christ that's being prepared for the day. We're not being being the, the bride that God will bring home that, that He has this great relationship with us. Because we're so set on our own desires when really He should be our desire. In Proverbs, which he quotes, and this is all, I'll end with this, uh, the, the moniker proud is not specifically to those with arrogance, um, but with those with self-importance. And they're really closely related, obviously. In the case of James, those whose own interests became their focused desires, rather than hoping above all else to reciprocate God's love for them, to the Father, especially as Paul might put it, to gain Christ. And that's what Paul said, right? I count everything I gain as loss compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. And this is especially true and especially perilous when people, the church, and especially pastors and leaders um, speak and act in church as if the desires of the world and desire of Christ are the same thing. They are not. So that's what this focus, that's what this passage is focused on. And, and granted, I, I didn't end on a real cheery note. Um, I wonder though if it's possible for us to read this passage and be hit as hard as I think the Jews were in that day. Because I think we read the, the passage of David, what he did to Uriah so that he could get his wife, and knowing that that was murder and wrong. I wonder if we view some of the ways that we treat one another, the way we go after our desires, that's just the same thing. Because ultimately, how we treat one another is not only a comment by how we treat one another. It's a comment about our relationship with God. And that's why Jesus came to put those things to death. And for us to receive grace in Christ Jesus is to say, no to our selfish desires and recognize the surpassing worth of knowing God in Christ and to have Him be not only the center of our desires but the center of everything and every way that we treat one another. So this is my encouragement to you and, and I hope we do take it hard but also know that we are people of grace and to encourage one another in that grace. And not to say, hey, you're being selfish and proud and you know, you're know you following the passions of your heart and you adulteress. Now don't ever say that. <laughs> James already did. Okay. I could just see some of you. Now, okay, I'm not going to say it. I'm going to say James 4-4. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> but instead to approach one another in forgiveness and grace. Because that's the spirit. That's the heart of God that says, you know what? I'm in a relationship with him. Our Heavenly Father, we desire to be people of, of that heart, of that message, and we desire to be a church that acts in that way. And it is so easy, Father, you know our hearts. 
to want to follow our own desires. And we see that every quarrel and fight that is not a helpful discussion full of grace and understanding is because we're a people that often follow our own desires, the heart. And Lord, while we desire to serve people in the world and to love them, we know that our heart, our friendship, our being connected is with you. And so, Lord, I pray even more so that you open our hearts that it might be, that you might be the desire of our hearts and that we would live lives that say that very thing that Jesus is our all in all. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him, because He cares for you. Yes. And after a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to His eternal glory in Christ, will Himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To Him be the dominion, forever and ever. Well, my